because now the shaft inertia is the motor and the ring gear, uh, reach, the ring gear inertia is transferred through a gear ratio. The final drive and the axle, the, you add them together, you get the inertia of the motor shaft. And the motor shaft it itself, uh, it, it has to add uh, the, also the uh, generator uh, shaft. The generator shaft inertia is transported by the primary gear also to the motor shaft. Okay. And the union shaft would include the cranking shaft itself, the, uh, uh, the carrier, and also uh, the, to the inertia transport from the initial transport from the generator side or the uh, sun gear side. So putting them together, you can get other inertia terms, terms and also you can develop the relationships of the uh, dynamic uh, torque and speed relationships. Again, you can uh, write down the steady state equations when you eliminate the dynamic terms of the, uh, of the uh, speed, uh, speed derivatives. So those are, uh, can be easily derived. With the second, the third is a two-mode hybrid that I want to discuss. In an earlier time, we did look at this two-mode hybrid operation, and we said there's a high range, there's a low range. But we did not go into detail to derive the relationships between uh, the two different operations, between output and input and the two different modes. So in this case, now we're going to look at uh, this in more detail, uh, how it operates both in terms of dynamic and in terms of steady state. In this diagram over here, you can see that it's a simplified drawing where we include uh, S1, C1, R1, the first planetary gear, with sun gear connected to MG1, ring gear connected to ICE1, ICE, and C1 connected to C2 and connected to final drive. Second planetary gear with S2 connected to G2, R2 connected to a clutch, CL2 and CL3, and C2 connected to final drive. The clutch CL3 and CL2 can be engaged at two different places. So we will look at what happens when we uh, engage clutch CL3. So CL2 now is open, so CL3 will ground R2. So when we ground R2, so before we go to the dynamics, in fact, I want to look at the steady state operation, how it operates. On planetary gear number one, we have three speeds. One is the engine speed, one is uh, the motor one speed, and one is the carrier speed. Carrier speed is proportional to the final drive speed. So we can write down the carrier speed is equal to times this times um, engine speed. So we call it engine speed. And then plus electrical motor one speed. That is connect to the sun gear. Omega, that's called M1. That's on the uh, first primary gear. On the second primary gear, R2 is grounded. So R2 is grounded means omega R is zero. Omega R2 is zero. So this is omega C1. So we can calculate omega C2 is equal to NS, NS plus NR times omega times this times omega m2 plus the ring gear is grounded, so that's zero. So you can see that omega c2 is uh, proportional to omega m2 because omega c1 is equal to omega c2, so the speed will not change on the carrier. However, the torque will change. So torque, if you look at tc2, it's going to be um, ns plus nr divided by ns times, times Tm2. So motor torque, Tm2, is added, is added to output shaft. Okay. Added to output shaft. So what it means is that all output is going to be Tc1 plus Tc2. Well, TC1 is a proportional to union torque. So let's just use K1 for now. 
to Te. And Tc2 is proportional, let's use K2, times Tm2. So this is considered as a torque coupling because you're adding the torque of the two uh, input. One is the, the engine, the other one is the electrical motor too. You're adding torque. So this is uh, called a low range for low vehicle speed operations. So you basically, you're basically adding torque of electrical motor too to the output shaft to assist the driving. So this is better for low speed operation. Now, we do, I do have the dynamic relationships derived. I don't want to go into details, but if you um, get rid of the dynamic terms, you're going to get the same set of equations that I just derived here. A second operation mode is a high mode in contrast to the low mode. In this high mode, in this high speed mode, CL2 is engaged, or CL3 is now open. When CO2 is engaged, the only difference is that omega S1 is connected to omega R2. So omega S1 is going to have the same speed as omega R2. Similarly, we can find omega C1 is going to be the same equations. I'm just going to use some, uh, uh, some ratios. R I1 times omega E plus I2 times omega M1, which is equal to omega S1. So omega M1 is equal to omega S1. And omega C2, in this case, in this case, omega C2 also has two input now because R2 is connected to S1. So you're going to get, let's call it I3 times omega M2 plus I4 times omega R2. Well, omega R2 is equal to omega S1 is equal to omega M1. So eventually, omega C1 is equal to omega C2. So that's for sure because they are on the same shaft. But omega C2 is going to be I3 times omega M2 plus I4 times omega M1, okay? And this is also equal to I1 times omega E plus I2 times omega M1. So with all these coefficients, I1, I2, I3, and I4 can be easily calculated uh, by using the set of gear ratios that we have. Therefore, you can see that the speed output, so the T output eventually it's going to be proportional to all the T input. But the speed is added. So speed of M2 added to output shaft. So this is called a speed coupling, which is good for high speed operation, which is good for high speed operation. And then this is called, also called a high range. And this is the set of, uh, if you look at chart, this is a set of dynamic equations that we derived based on the uh, dynamics of the system. Now, if you neglect all the dynamic terms, you can derive the steady state relationships based on this set of equations. So by this moment, we, uh, I finished all the lectures. I, I know some of those things are pretty uh, deep. For example, the dynamics of the planetary gear system. It, it's going to take a lot of effort if you, your background is not in the mechanical engineering area. But however, I hope that this will give you, this will give you a flavor of every aspect of a PHEV. And you will have at least a first kind of information on where to find the information that you need if you want to get into this area. So in summary, those PHEVs, they are not a solution to our energy and environment issues. I have to say this, they're not a solution. But they do provide a partial solution because if we, in the future, we can develop renewable energy to dominate 
or energy electricity energy supply, we can definitely use PHV as a solution to our energy problem. So it, is, it itself is not a solution, but it relies on some other solutions to go further. Overall, PHV is meaningful. It's going to make a difference if we have millions of PHVs on the road. You're going to see big difference in terms of energy consumption reduction and emission reductions. If we get to the point we have a few million, up to 25%, say 60 million vehicles on the road. The successful penetration of PHV apparently will depend on manufacturers. It's not just OEM making them, but it also the consumers have to accept them. One of the important factors is oil price. If gasoline price is super cheap, buying a PHV will spend a lot of money that people will never get it back. But if gasoline price goes beyond $6 per gallon in the U.S., I can guarantee that many people will start to look into PHUs. So that's one of the dominating factors. Of course, other factors which include government support, uh, OEMs um, uh, support, battery development. Talking about battery development, with large uh, penetration of PHUs, with the demonstration underway, the price of batteries are going to drop, that's for sure. And it may drop to the point that the energy that we save by using a PHUE can be recovered by the savings of a fuel. So this may eventually help to promote PHUE uh, in the marketplace. So overall, again, it's not a simple issue and there's no definite answer at this, this moment whether PHUE is going to dominate or whether it's going to be very, very successful. It depends on manufacturers that is coming up in the next couple of years. Before I close my video, I want also just to give you a br very brief over overview of what, what we do at the University of Michigan Durham. Our research apparently is around is centered around power electronics, and with that area, we can have three different type of researches, including fundamental research, applied research, and interdisciplinary research. In the fundamental area, uh, we're dealing with silicon carbide, which is a newer device. Uh, have, they have the potential to further increase the switching frequency, reducing losses, and increase operating temperature. And if that one comes in um, to a large uh, mass production with the price comparable to the current silicon we use, that's going to also impact the PHEV penetration because you can make the power electronics smaller, more efficient, um, less uh, heat management requirement, and so on. We are dealing with iron losses of electric motors, PM motors, with the optimum design with iron loss. Um, calculation and modeling method with nanotechnology that is going into making silicon uh, steel, silicon steel sheets. You're going to be able to design high efficiency motors. Therefore, it's also going to help PHUV penetration. Our research partially focuses on short-term scale phenomena in power electronics because when you're switching, there's a lot of phenomena that cannot be explained by traditional uh, Maxwell equations. So we have to get down to a lot of transient uh, effects. And again, that research may uh, have some meaning in terms of improving reliability um, and safety of our power electronic systems. Nanoparticle-based uh, heating and cooling systems are going to take shape in the next couple of years. It's going to improve cooling efficiency, and it's going to help heating of the batteries as well. Advanced the topologies that can fit newer devices. So those are the things that uh, many uh, experts in this area are also focusing on. The next area is applied research. With power electronics, they, don't, they not only just apply to HEV, but they also apply to many other applications, such as space, electric ships, and so on. Uh, so those areas, uh, again, it's going to have some significant impact when we move towards uh, more renewable energy uh, generations, 
for example, you can build a self-sufficient farm that will have its own power generation, batteries, power electronics, uh, advanced controls that it's going to manage its own uh, system. In the interdisciplinary area, that involves mechanical, electrical, chemical, thermal, and areas. So it in requires expertise from a different area. So we are collaborating with faculty across the discipline, and so is many other uh, academic institutions and OEM and suppliers. They are working in a team to improve the system design and so on. So this is kind of uh, uh, what we do at our institution. Uh, our research is funded by a number of different agencies, including the U.S. Army, NSF, Army Lab, uh, ONR, DOE, and OEM uh, suppliers. To close my talk, I want to thank you for taking this tutorial. I know some of the material uh, are pretty uh, deep. Some of the, those are maybe uh, on the surface. So I hope to give you uh, enough information that you can uh, dig around to find your own to go forward from that point. I also want to thank my students, uh, postdocs, PhDs. They are the ones that who did all the research and helped me with all the, uh, with all the, uh, all the results, all the PhDs that we developed. And I also thank uh, the sponsors who have supported my research in the past eight years. So thank you very much for taking this tutorial. And closing tutorial, I also want you to look at a video made by IEEE. And that video can be downloaded from uh, YouTube or IEEE website. This is a nine, with nine minutes video. It's going, to, uh, it's going to talk about what's going on within IEEE about plugging HEV. Thank America you and enjoy. Cars, but this relationship comes at a price. Pollution, global warming, high fuel costs, and a country that is addicted to foreign oil, a problem that has become increasingly troubling in recent years. The whole world in trying to gain access to oil and natural gas, and especially oil, uh, puts one on a headlong course, a collision course among many countries uh, of who will get this oil in the future. It's almost uh, unbelievable that a country of the, of the superpower, the United States, would find themselves in a spot where they were dependent on oil from countries that were not friendly to us. We have to stop using so much oil, and that means we must find alternative fuels. Why is it important that we need to continue to make this transition away from petroleum towards biofuels and electrons? In a nutshell, oil is costing us dearly and hurting our economy, our environment, and our national security. Today, there are millions of vehicles on the road that already use less gasoline, hybrid cars. But many feel these are not good enough to make the dramatic change we need. Today's hybrid cars, like the Prius, use a combination of electricity and gas. They get good mileage, but still rely on gas to power the engine and to charge the battery. The next step is the plug-in hybrid. With plug-in hybrids, we're going to take the technology one step further than regular hybrids by combining the booming popularity of hybrid vehicles with the added energy efficiency and cost effectiveness of our nation's electricity grid. It's a really exciting time in American history because we're standing on the cusp of a new generation of vehicles that can truly revolutionize our national energy paradigm. Although the change to our climate will take years, the changes in fuel economy and cost are immediate. I get really good gas mileage. 100 miles per gallon is, it isn't a, a myth, you know, that's a reality in a car like this. In the city from 150 to 225 miles per gallon, and on the highway anywhere from 85 to 110 miles per gallon, every single car that has this battery added to it uh, will save 80% gasoline, that's oil imports, and 60% emissions. And there isn't anything else that the Congress or any of the states are looking at right now that can give you that kind of short-term response. Today, most plug-in hybrids are conversions of existing hybrids, mainly the Prius. 
The fact that you can't buy plugins right now is a problem because we believe that plugin hybrids should be commercially available. So in order to do that, we actually converted some Priuses into plug-in hybrids so that we didn't have to wait for the automakers to make them. We didn't make any modifications to the drivetrain of the car. That's pretty much stock. The main changes are in the back of the car. We added a larger battery pack. So if so many people believe the plug-in hybrid is such a great idea, why don't we have them already? Many of the reasons relate to one item. So you can say the big problem is batteries, 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 and the big problem with the batteries is cost, cost, cost. Um, so that's the major hurdle that has to be overcome. Right now, the, the batteries in this car cost more than the car itself. It's believed costs will come down with mass production, but there are other issues. To appeal to consumers, the battery needs to be powerful and have a long lifespan. Conventional lithium ion has very high energy, but it doesn't have power and it doesn't have uh, good safety and the life is very short. If you think about a cell phone, the battery only lasts a couple of years, two or three years. In a vehicle, it needs to last 10 years and you need very high power. So it needs to deliver a burst of, of, of energy really quickly to drive the acceleration. Other issues being tackled by engineers concern safety and disposal. Even if these challenges are met, this still won't be a car for long distances. But many people feel that this won't be an issue for most consumers. 70% of all Americans drive under 40 miles per day on their annual commute. So the kind of coverage that you could get being able to plug it into your garage every night, 60 cents will take you about 40 miles compared to what gasoline costs. The race is on to produce a battery that will satisfy all these requirements. New batteries have been developed and battery technology is improving uh, as we speak. Almost every year better batteries are coming out. Even if batteries do improve, there is still one major roadblock. We know the technology of electric cars works. We know that advanced batteries work. We're trying to put it all together and to convince those executives in Detroit that there is a viable business case to be made for electric and hybrid vehicles is still a very, very difficult thing to do. Ultimately, our goal at Google.org is to convince the automakers that plug-in hybrids are the way of the future and that there are so many benefits and there's so much demand for these cars that they should be making them themselves and that conversions wouldn't be necessary. You know, we had an electric and hybrid vehicle program in this country in 1976. 1976. Okay, 31 years ago. So you would have thought, and by now we would have had millions of these electric and hybrid vehicles running around in the U.S., and of course, it hasn't happened. Well, we don't have millions, but the auto industry is beginning to see that these cars are in demand, and at least a few companies are promising production of plug-in hybrids in a few years. So what we are doing to try to help that market is to put some incentives on the table for individual consumers that will buy a plug-in car, for utilities that will help build out this smart electricity grid, and for the auto manufacturers who will actually make these initial cars. Unlike other alternative fuels, plug-in hybrids require little change to the nation's infrastructure, since electricity is all around and being produced all the time. This is the greatest oil and emission savings for the least amount of infrastructure change based on a technology that is just about arrived. That's very, very exciting. Although plug-in hybrids could be used by millions of Americans, they are not for every household. Plug-in isn't the solution to everything. Plug-ins really aren't something that can be used by everybody. They're essentially a tool that can be used by people who live in the suburbs, like people who have a garage or a carport or have access to charging. So it's part of a range of different solutions, but it's not the solution. Even with their limitations, many people believe plug-in hybrids will provide enormous benefits for our society and that they are even essential for our future. Very seldom do new technologies emerge that can literally change the world. And I truly believe that plug-in hybrids are one of these technologies. I believe that this plug-in hybrid area may be critical to the survival of humanity. It is clear that all roads lead to alternative fuel for our cars. Many scientists believe that if we don't change our energy habits soon, there will be serious consequences. 
This really is trying to save the world as we know it. The real question is, can we do it fast enough before, before a major cataclysm occurs in terms of the oil supply on this planet? Because certainly the United States, which consumes about a quarter of the world's supply, is going to be especially vulnerable. It's going to hit our economy and our way of life very, very hard if we can't get a grip on this very quickly. Maybe it's just people haven't realized inside themselves just how difficult and personal the challenges are that we are all facing as a species. And maybe in 40 years we'll take them more seriously, but unfortunately that may be too late if we don't do something in the meantime.